It's a week later. That body still would have been at the hospital with no way to have her final wishes taken care of because the financial institution that talks about avoiding probate just use these beneficiary designations. It's Hi, Jeff Versace, the Plain English Attorney, and unfortunately, we're going to talk about another probate disaster story. And unfortunately for me, this is something that I'm kind of right in the middle of. So let's go ahead. Uh, I'm going to give the deceased person the name Tasha. Okay, just watching some, uh, some old Star Trek Next Generation episodes. Uh, so we just pulled the name Tasha. All right, so... Uh, Tasha's a client. She's been a client of ours for many, many years. Uh, in fact, thinking about it, about 20 years, we have first put together her estate plan. But Tasha kind of knew better. She wanted to avoid probate, but she wanted to do it inexpensively. And so she put up this whole series of what we call duct tape solutions. So, Oh, well, I've got this account and it's pay on death here. And I got this account, pay on death here. I got this account, pay on death here. She had all of that sewn up in order to avoid having to put together a revocable living trust as the way to handle her entire plan. Okay. Well, 2004, she had her executors lined up and we warned her at that time, well, look, if everything's pay on death, well, then it's just going to be very, very difficult for your executor to be able to grab a hold of money through the court process to take care of your bills and the funeral bills and, uh, you know, any type of uh, creditors. If you have a final illness and there's like unpaid medical bills that weren't handled by insurance, that's going to be an issue. Uh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Fast forward 10 years later, which is 10 years ago uh, for us, and she needed to update things. Now, I need to give just a little bit of more of a background. Tasha was kind of estranged from her family, didn't really like them, didn't really deal with them. They weren't in her life. So they weren't executors. It was friends. So in 2014, she comes back to us and says, look, here are my two best friends in the world. They're in that executor list, but they're both going through personal matters. There's stuff that if anything just happened to me, it would, they wouldn't be able to really devote the time to it. They, it, they just, no, they can't do it. If you think it's important for educational videos like this to get out there, then please help us out by subscribing to the channel. Well, let's look through alternatives. We could have, you know, do you, there's absolutely no family members. No, absolutely not. Okay, any other friends? I mean, we even suggest are the children of your friends, adults, mature and able to potentially handle that? No, none of that. And then she did something uh, that I generally don't, uh, like to hear, Jeff, can you do it? Okay, I laid out, here's what's going to, you know, here's what would happen. We are much more of a law firm focused on the planning end of things. We'd like to do revocable trust to help our clients avoid the whole probate process. We could come up with some very good solutions to avoid these problems, but probate is cleaning up the mess. All right, well, okay, this is something that we will assist with and we will help with. But on the planning end, we really prefer to help them avoid probate. And me being the executor, look, we really try to discourage that. But she was in a tough spot. So Tasha asked us and I said, well, look, one, we need to make sure that this is just a temporary thing. You're not going to just leave it in there. For years and years and years and years, 
you're going to come back when this either the situation resolves itself with your very close friends who were listed before or you find other people and so repeatedly over the years hey you got a plan can we make this change no 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 second thing is we made her or we asked her to didn't get confirmation asked her to identify one account of a decent size that would be made payable upon death to the estate to make sure that there was sufficient money to take care of all of those things that I mentioned before. Last final illness bills from hospital and doctors, uh, any credit card bills that might be on the table, uh, and handling everything through probate. And I told her, look, we're not going to just do this. We can't do this for free. We also have to get paid out of the estate. If you don't do this, this could be a huge, much bigger deal, which is what she wanted to avoid. Because if there isn't money payable to the estate, then that means we have to do something to stop the other accounts from being transferred out to those beneficiaries or if the financial institutions released it because according to their contract they release it then we're going to have to initiate collection suits in order to get money back into the estate to pay for these things and that's just way more work than it really needs to be okay make sure this happens okay i will all right here we are 10 years later i don't have any proof that that happened she passed on as i'm recording this it was about a week ago and we started getting the phone calls from uh, people she had a, uh, a kind of private uh, patient advocate in the area because her friends were out of town and i don't just mean like half an hour or an hour away like way out of town and we started getting the calls it's like okay i guess we're gonna have to check out and do these things and she said you know this was prior to her passing on and you know just telling us look it's not looking good who's in charge here who has this who's the executor who's the power of attorney these th there are things that need to get done and then we get the message that she passed on the patient advocate is asking us, well, look, we need to get someone to sign the paperwork accepting financial responsibility on behalf of Tasha for the estate in order to get her to the funeral home. Well, look, it's been 10 years. We don't have any of that information. I was the executor. She never changed it as far as I know. She ended up giving that patient advocate my name and my law firm's name. So I don't think there was an update with another attorney. Okay, here I am in the position of being the executor. So she had been working with the same financial advisor and I'd worked with that financial advisor. And I just tried to call the office. Uh, it was, look, it was a holiday weekend, but there had to have been some kind of coverage there. And just trying to see and make sure okay look as long as there's something payable to the estate and like an approximate amount we know what we're dealing with she had enough general details actually listed in her will for what she wanted for burial versus cremation and these other things and we could figure out about what it would cost so as long as that was covered then it would have been fine nope we need letters testamentary from the court. Okay, let me make sure I'm being very clear about the situation here. Tasha's body was at the hospital. The funeral home would not take custody to do what they needed to do until someone signed paperwork. 
And the financial institution that held her money for all these years and said, oh, it's going to be easy because it's all pay on death. No, nope, we need letters testamentary from the court. Right now, it's a minimum of three to four weeks before an estate can be submitted and then get the letters testamentary. That's on the minimum end. It's probably closer to five to six weeks. The hospital isn't going to hold that body for five to six weeks. There's no money there that we can say, yes, we can go ahead and do this. So I end up getting in touch with her friends who are out of town. They know the situation. They're looped in. And they're trying to get mail. Okay, mail wasn't going to her residence anymore. She had been in the hospital for months. So her apartment was already cleared out and leased out to someone else. She had stuff in storage. Someone was picking up her mail. The patient advocate only had the first name of the person, not who this person actually was. And so we couldn't track them down to say, okay, if you can at least get us some information. Currently, we're talking with the storage place that has all of the stuff from her apartment. And we don't know how much or how little it is, but we're going to actually have to dig through all that information in order to see, is there money there? And I've already gone through and talked with this financial institution, the one that I had been working with, the advisor and their staff for 20 years. I was authorized to receive information. Nope. All that ends when she dies. So we're not going to give you any information until you get those letters testamentary from the court. Thankfully, one of her friends had the means to actually pay the funeral home and is okay getting reimbursed later. If that didn't happen, she has what one of the friends was telling me about because they talked with her about finances. She has hundreds of thousands of dollars with this financial institution, but we couldn't pay the funeral bill out of that money. Right. This is where we end up with this whole duct tape solution. Yeah, just avoid probate. Do, uh, you know, go ahead and do joint tenancy with a right of survivorship. Well, at least if that had happened one of those friends would have had the money and have access to it a lot more quickly. All they need is a death certificate or payable upon death. Oh, that's going to be fine. That's going to avoid probate. Well, look, if everything avoids probate and the money isn't going to someone who's going to use it in order to uh, take care of the final bills, well, then it, it's actually making things much more difficult. And it's going to be okay disclosing this uh, because it's going to be part of the public record anyway. Once we file that will, Tasha left everything to charity. And her friends are okay with that. Her family probably wouldn't be, but look, they hadn't really talked to her as far as I know in all those years. So, okay, if they find out she's passed on and they want something, they're not beneficiaries. But there's nothing there to actually take care of, handle the medical bills and things like that. All because of this, oh, we'll just go ahead and use uh, beneficiary designations in order to handle this rather than setting up a revocable living trust. So here's how things could have been much different if we had a revocable living trust in place. When uh, the patient advocate and the friends started calling about a week and a half to two weeks prior to her death, oh, we need copies of this power of attorney and whatnot. And, okay, here's who we have to send it to. If they had said, look, she's just not capable and we, don't, we know that her accounts are in a revocable trust, then we would have seen, okay, I would have been the successor trustee, not just the executor. 
all right, I could step in, get some information from the doctors, just basically doctor's notes, she's incapable of handling her own affairs. And we could have gotten control of those assets like that because they would have accepted the terms of the trust that said, here's the successor trustee and all it takes for them to be removed is two physicians to certify in writing that they are not capable of handling their own affairs. We would have been able to step in right away and take care of this and be proactive so that everything gets settled immediately. That's not what happened. Um, all it would have taken after death would have been that death certificate because again, the terms of the trust say, okay, the successor trustee steps in immediately after the person has passed on. Would have been gotten control of everything right away. Uh, but of course that didn't happen because we didn't have that revocable living trust in place. And the trust says, okay, the trustee is authorized to step in and take care of all of these expenses. We could have settled that very, very quickly. All it would have taken, again, was the death certificate and the trust showing, hey, we're in charge and we would have had access to those hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure that everything got taken care of as quickly as possible. But that's, not, again, that's not what happened. Uh, so I'd like for you to just imagine what would have happened if if Tasha did not have a friend who was willing to pay those funeral expenses for her? It's a week later. That body still would have been at the hospital with no way to have her final wishes taken care of because the financial institution that talks about avoiding probate just use these beneficiary designations, it's going to be fine, it's going to avoid probate, all because they now won't talk to anybody or provide any information until those letters testamentary come out, that body would have been left at the hospital and someone else, you know, the state would have had to have figured it out. So this is one of the strongest situational disasters that I can talk about, about just how ridiculous ridiculous it ends up being trying to use a beneficiary designation to avoid probate without a revocable living trust to just take care of it it could have been it it literally could have been more than a month before we could have gotten authorization in order to check out the finances and start paying those bills it's going to be at least a month right now where are we we're waiting on the death certificate. Once that happens, we can file papers with the court, but there is processing time. Like I said, the court will say three to four weeks. That might be a little more optimistic. It's probably closer to five to six weeks. Uh, we recently did a probate in this county and had to submit the papers. It was about four and a half weeks or so. But Again, it's also the holidays, you know, summer holiday around the July 4th weekends and everybody taking vacation. Who knows? So this is just that, just another big example of why it makes a lot more sense to take a look at a comprehensive plan with the revocable living trust being the base of it and making sure the trust is funded rather than relying on these beneficiary designations and other duct tape solutions to handle your estate. Right. So I hope you found that story at least entertaining. I have a feeling we're probably going to provide some update videos uh, as this thing moves along. But again, just take away that big lesson Listing beneficiary designations on everything to avoid probate can cause a much bigger mess than using a revocable living trust. All right. So as I always tell my clients, please stay safe, plan ahead the right way, and enjoy life. And whatever you do, make it a great day.